Glenn, uh, you've made it clear that you're somewhat uncomfortable uh, accepting all this praise and adulation, but um, what does it say to you that the, the community uh, and the organization still holds you in this kind of high regard after all these years, and what are your emotions as you come back to uh, see your name go up in the rafters? Well, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very complicated question to answer, and I'm not sure I'm capable of doing it after being stunned today with what's happened already. Um, you know, I've spent most of my life in Edmonton and uh, really all started here, so when you start to think about the memories that you had when you were here for the uh, 25 years, uh, plus the years that I went to school at, and uh, played junior hockey here, I mean, that's, that's a long time. There's a lot of memories and people say, well, what do you remember the most? I think I remember the relationships with the friends that I have the most, and, and even some of the fights I had with the media. But, uh, you know, hockey was the big part of, of what it exposed me to. But the friendship of the people here, I think those are the memories that I have the best of the city. And there was certainly a lot of them. There's a generation out there who may wonder then, having won four Stanley Cups as a head coach, why you didn't go the Scotty Bowman round and, and, and maybe pursue a fifth, sixth, seventh? Because certainly at, at that time, you had the team and personnel to do it. What led to the transition to management? Well, I have this theory that, that every coach has a number of years that you can be successful. And I think that, that no matter how successful you are, the coach is going to wear out his welcome with the players. And even Scotty Bowman moved around. and. Uh, after a while, you get a sense that maybe another direction is better. And that's, that's why I gave up the coaching when I did. And John Mucker was a great coach, so it, it was an easy transition for him to step right into it. And uh, it was easy for me to just to do what I was doing. And you didn't want to move around and, and join another organization at that time and, and be a head coach and start over again? No, no, I never thought about leaving here. I mean, that. I didn't have that in the back of my mind at all. But some of the events that transpired, you can't control them. And then when you get into the position of making a choice, you have to make some choices that are uncomfortable. But I certainly wasn't ever thinking about that. You were more than a coach at that point. I mean, you were in your late 30s, in some cases not many years older than some of your players. But uh, you adopted a somewhat of a paternal role. Is, is that a, a fair subject where when players or <laughs> Or staff members had a problem, you were, you were often the first guy they, they dialed up? Well, I had more connections. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think when guys get in trouble, I used to say to them, and I knew there was going to be some problems at some point in time. I mean, uh, we had a pack of young guys. And I said, call me before you call your agent, because I can help you a lot more than he can. Care to clear up uh, the, uh, the often told uh, tales of how Messier came into the organization? I mean, I've heard more stories about how he came to be drafted by this club uh, than anyone well, should What have you heard? <laughs> well, I, I, I've, heard you, I've heard anything from you had no idea who he was to it was a favor that you did to uh, you knew it all along and you knew the kind of player he'd be. No, oh, I... I knew Doug, Doug Messier. I mean, he was the first guy that uh, really knocked me out. I guess I could sue the league now for concussion, <laughs> thinking about that. But uh, he was the first guy to, to knock me out. I was playing for the Oil Kings. Uh, we played against the Evan and Flyers. Uh, he caught me with my head down and got me a good elbow. It was a good lesson. But uh, I saw Mark play in St. Albert when he was young. I mean... He was young when he was uh, in the NHL, and he was young when he was played in the WHA, but I'm talking about either 14 or 15 years old. And of course, I'd seen him in the WHA. Brian Watson knew him well because they played in the same team together. Uh, Mark didn't have a lot of points that year, but uh, we played against him, and uh, Dennis Sobchuk was our star on the team that year, and Mark, I think, was 17. He beat the tar out of him. And uh, I like that about him. I said, uh, this guy's going to be a real good competitive player someday. And then we got into the draft, and of course, Barry and I had our regular argument about when we're going to, who and who we're going to draft. 
And uh, Mark slipped to the third round and said, we're taking him. And he said, no, we're not. He said, we are. We took him. That was it. Was there a moment, I mean, obviously you got Gretzky and, and, and there were some early drafts that brought some young players into the organization, but when did you begin to realize that not only did you have something here, but you had something here that, that would last for you know, six, seven, eight years as, as a real contender? When did the team offer you that first glimmer of what they would become? Uh, when they started to have fun on the ice and, you know, they, they bought into the motion that I was trying to get them to do and, and switch sides and move, move and play at full speed. Um, I can't tell you exactly when the moment happened, but I like to say the moment happened when we got Wayne from Indianapolis. And that was really the start because at that time, uh, you know, the foundation was there and I just had to surround him with other people that could compliment him and he could make them into better players. And it was great. I mean, can you think of what it would have been like if we had been able to keep Bent Aki Gustafson too? And the league screwed us out of that deal, but, but uh, he should have been here as well. Glenn, um, we heard the mayor talk about how he was four and five years old when, when the first cup was won, and there's a number of fans downstairs, some with one guy with your old hockey stick, uh, you know, getting signatures and pictures. What, what does it feel like uh, being here and, and running into those fans? I mean, it's been 15 years since you left, 25, 30, 30 years since you guys won, but yet the impact that you and the players have had on these people is, has lasted. Well, it's pretty overwhelming for me. I mean, I was stunned today with what Kate's had done and uh, just the reception from the mayor and all of this. Um, Listen to my wildest dream. I've never expected to do this. I didn't, ex I didn't uh, have any idea what was going to happen. I mean, the, the banner hanging is, and I call it a hanging, but the, uh, putting the players' names in the rafter, I can understand that. But to have mine there, I mean, that was pretty shocking when they called me and asked me this summer if I would do it. And I said, well, what can I say? But as the generations pass and, and the memories disappear, I mean, it changes, and, uh, you know, people aren't going to remember everything, but I suppose when they look at the, those names in the rafters in the next building, it passes the heritage down, just like the Montreal Forum and the gardens do. I mean, there's, this is part of everybody's building. But for my name to be there, it's kind of unusual. I think Al Arbor and Bill Torrey are the only other guys that I know about. I mean, maybe, Matty, you might know, or Bill might know. So it's unusual, and it's, it's a great honor.